Welcome to the second episode of the Structural MD Podcast. I am your host, James Hillegas. So this one might be a little bit long. I'm going to try and give the best I can background, overview, history of additive manufacturing, if you will. Now, it's been around since the mid-1980s, so you can do the math. It's roughly 30, going on 40 years And I really just don't want to sit here and it be a history lesson of very boringly going through the chronological order of this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. I really would like to try and avoid that at all cost. So I will do my best to keep this short and sweet but still give you the needed information that you came here for. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. So real quick, we're going to kind of just glance through the background, if you will, uh, just give you some general overview information of the additive manufacturing world. So some synonyms for additive manufacturing or 3D printing are additive fabrications, additive processes, additive techniques, additive layer manufacturing, and freeform fabrication. Just some good to knows so you're up with the lingo and the jargon of the technical world. Additive manufacturing is used to build physical models, prototypes, patterns, tooling components, and production parts in plastic, metal, ceramic, glass, and composite materials. The general processes of additive manufacturing systems use thin cross-sections from 3D models created by a CAD platform, 3D scanning system, medical scanners, and or video games. There are seven distinct processes within additive manufacturing where the parts are created layer by layer. They are extruding, jetting, photocuring, laminating, and fusing. Your typical additive manufacturing materials include plastics, metals, ceramics, and composites. Your feedstock options, which is how does the material come to you, the raw material, before it is printed. And that can be in a filament, a paste, a liquid, a powder, a pellet or a sheet. Design and manufacturing organizations will use additive manufacturing for products in consumer, industrial, medical, and military markets. Some examples are of the very, very, very long list. Cameras, mobile phones, engine parts, interior trim parts for cars, parts and assemblies for aircrafts, power tools, medical implants, and I could go on and on. Additive manufacturing is a tool that streamlines and expedites product development processes. It reduces the time to market, improves product quality, reduces costs, and is used as a visualization tool. People also use additive manufacturing to improve performance of injection mold tooling to achieve results that are simply not possible with machine tooling. You can produce manufacturing and assembly tools, jigs, fixtures, gauges, templates, and drill and cutting guides. Now, because of additive manufacturing's growth and widespread use, the typical governing or standardizing bodies are trying to catch up in the process of creating standardized testing, definitions, processes, etc. Big committees are obviously ASTM. They formed a subcommittee, F42, on additive manufacturing, which, as they define it, additive manufacturing is the process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data, usually layer upon layer as opposed to subtractive manufacturing methods. Then until now, in the show notes at structural-md.com backslash p002, there's going to be a larger PDF document in the show notes. The document is very in-depth. Again, here on the show, I'm just going to try and walk you through the general commercialization, the businesses, the breakthroughs, This segment might still be a little bit long. I'm not sure. Obviously, you're going to find out with me. I just want to try my best to avoid giving you a really long history lesson. I also apologize if I butcher people's names. I'm an ignorant American. I can't pronounce everything. Then until now. In 1996, the Wohler's Report, which is basically the industry report for additive manufacturing, almost like ESPN is quote-unquote the industry report for sports. So in 1996, they showed that additive manufacturing is worth just under $300 million. 
just under 18 years later, it showed that additive manufacturing as an industry was worth $4.1 billion, quite the large growth. In 2007, the industry broke through the $1 billion mark. Just to give some scale into the whole industry, in 1995, there were 15 system manufacturers located in the United States, Germany, and Japan, and there were 526 additive manufacturing systems sold. Just under 20 years later, in 2014, there were 49 system manufacturers located all around the world in 13 different countries. There was 12,850 industrial systems. An industrial system is defined as anything that sells for greater than 5 grand, whereas a desktop system is anything that sells for less than 5 grand. And those desktop systems came in at just under 140,000 units sold. Before the first systems. The first attempt to create solid objects using photopolymers using a laser took place in the late 1960s at Battelle Memorial Institute. The experiment involved intersecting two laser beams of differing wavelength in the middle of a vat of resin attempting to polymerize, which means solidify, the material at the point of intersection. In 1967, Wynne K. Swanson of Denmark applied for a patent titled Method of Producing a 3D Figure by Holography on a similar dual laser beam approach. Subsequently, he launched Formographic Engine Company. Later, in the early 1970s, Formographic Engine Company used the dual laser approach in the first commercial laser prototyping project, a process it called photochemical machining. In 1974, Formographic demonstrated the generation of a 3D object using a rudimentary system. Hideo Kodoma of the Nagoya Municipal Industrial Research Institute, Nagoya, Japan, was among the first to invent the single laser beam curing approach, according to several sources. In May 1980, he applied for a patent in Japan, which later expired without proceeding to the examination stage, a requirement of the Japanese patent application process. He claimed to have difficulty in securing funds for additional research and development. In October 1980, he published a paper titled, three-dimensional data display by automatic preparation of a three-dimensional model that outlined his work in detail. In July 1984, Jean-Claude André, now with the French National Center for Scientific Research in Nancy, France, and his colleagues working for a French company filed a patent titled Apparatus for Fabricating a Model of an Industrial Part Involving a Single Laser Beam Approach. The French patent was granted in January 1986. Laser 3D, also of Nancy France, tried to commercialize the technique outlined in the patent on a service basis with no plans to sell the systems. In August 1984, Charles Haw, co-founder and chief technology officer of 3D Systems, which at that time was located in Valencia, California, applied for a U.S. patent titled Apparatus for Production of Three-Dimensional Objects by Stereolithography. The patent was granted in March 1986. The First Systems Additive manufacturing first emerged in 1987 with stereolithography, commonly abbreviated SL, from 3D systems. This process solidifies thin layers of ultraviolet light-sensitive liquid polymer using a laser. In 1988, 3D Systems and Sibia Gurji partnered in stereolithography materials development and commercialized the first generation of acrylic resins. 3D Systems was a U.S.-based company. Companies in other countries soon began to follow in the footsteps of 3D Systems. Japan's NTT Data CMET and Sony slash DMEC commercialized versions of stereolithography in 1988 and 1989 respectively. NTT Data CMET called its system Solid Object Ultraviolet Plotter, abbreviated SOUP, while Sony slash DMEC called its product Solid Creation System, SCS. This is a common trend you're going to see in all of additive manufacturing. 
the practice by which someone else copies a prior proprietary technology but tweaks it just enough to create their own proprietary version of it. In 1990, Electro Optical Systems EOS of Germany sold its first stereolithography system. The first non stereolithography based processes. In 1991, three new additive manufacturing technologies that were not stereolithography based were commercialized. Stratus commercialized Fused Deposition Modeling, commonly abbreviated FDM. I will touch briefly on what each process is, but will devote later episodes to going more in depth. FDM extrudes thermoplastic materials in a filament form to produce parts layer by layer. Cubital began to sell a process called solid ground curing. Solid ground curing uses a UV-sensitive liquid polymer solidifying full layers in one pass by flooding UV light through mask created with electrostatic toner on a glass plate. Lastly, a company called Helis sold printers that used laminated object manufacturing, abbreviated LOM, which bonded and cut sheet material using a digitally guided laser. Today, both Cubital and Helios have not been in business for many years. The following year, in 1992, Selective Laser Sintering, abbreviated SLS from DTM, now a part of 3D Systems, became available after being discovered at the University of Texas in the 1980s. Selective laser sintering uses heat from a laser to fuse powder materials. Also that year, Soliform Stereolithography System from Tenji Siki, now a part of CMET, was first released. In 1993, Soligen commercialized direct shell production casting using an inkjet mechanism. Direct shell production casting deposited liquid binder onto ceramic powder to form shells for use in the investment casting process. Roughly five years into the industry existing, Denkin introduced a stereolithography system that used a solid state laser. This system was the first of the price wars as Denkin's stereolithography system was one of the first to fit on a bench top and was introduced at a low price point compared to other stereolithography systems that were on the market. In 1996, Schroff Development began to sell its semi-automated paper lamination system for under $10,000. Before the close of the millennium, two new processes were introduced. In 1998, Optimac commercialized its laser-engineered net shaping metal powder system, abbreviated LENS. It was based on technology developed at Sandia National Labs. The following year, in March 1999, Fockel & Schwartz of Germany introduced its steel powder-based selective laser melting system, developed in cooperation with the Fraunhofer Institute for Laser Technology. While most of the world might have stopped because of the Y2K scare, the additive manufacturing industry did not. April 2000 was a month full of new technology introductions. Object Geometries of Israel announced Quadra, a 3D inkjet printer that deposited and hardened photopolymer using 1500 nozzles and a UV light source. Sanders Prototype, now Solidscape, introduced Pattern Master, a machine designed to produce precision wax patterns. Precision Optical Manufacturing announced a direct metal deposition, a laser cladding process that produces and repairs parts using metal powder. Z Corp introduced its 402C machine, the world's first commercially available multicolor 3D printer. At Euromold 2001, a world fair for mold making, tooling, additive manufacturing, design, and product development, Z Corp introduced its Z810, a system that prints parts in a 500 by 600 by 400 cubic millimeter build volume using 1800 jets from six HP print heads. In 2002, Envision Tech began to sell its perfectory and bioplotter machines. The bioplotter produces scaffold structures from various biomaterials for tissue engineering. Now, we were not only printing in metals, plastics, and ceramics, but also living human tissue. Between 2002 and 2004, there were not many noteworthy advances in the additive manufacturing world. 
Some companies were born and others died off. Some legal disagreements surrounding the technology occurred, but this has happened every year since the advent of the technology. By the mid-2000s, most of the basic printing principles were set up. Now we start to see a transition towards more advanced materials and improving the printer's speed, resolution, and reliability. In April of 2005, DSM Somos introduced several new resins at the Stereolithography and Selective Laser Centering User Conference, including a nanocomposite material, a high elongation material, a low durometer material, a UL94V0 flame retardant material, and a material that can withstand relatively high temperatures. In early 2006, the Swedish company Speedpart, now a part of Sintermask, began to ship its system. The machine used infrared lamps to project light through a mask to center an entire laser of powder. The cycle time for each layer is reportedly less than 10 seconds, regardless of the area centered. Stratus signed an agreement with Arcam to be the exclusive distributor in North America for electron beam melting, abbreviated EBM. It wouldn't be until the end of the year before such a machine would be installed stateside. The basics of EBM is that metal powder or wire is welded together using an electron beam as a heat source instead of a laser. Later in quarter two of 2006, EOS introduced stainless steel and cobalt chrome materials. The technology started to expand to other applications for 3D printing. Instead of just being a new part or prototyping tool, one could use a 3D scanner to create a 3D point cloud that could be printed in reverse engineering applications. Z Corp introduced Z Scanner 700, a handheld 3D scanner for under $40,000. Before the close of 2006, we witnessed many companies expand headquarters and move continents. In November of 2006, 3D Systems opened its new headquarters in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and Stratus opened a new office in Shanghai, China, while Object opened a sales and support office near Boston, Massachusetts. 2007 was off to a bang as companies began to break through previously assumed price walls. Z Corp introduced the Z Printer 450, the first color 3D printer to break the $40,000 price point. The most interesting feature of the system was that the automated removal and recycling of loose powder. Advanced Laser Materials released its new fire retardant polyamide for laser sintering systems. It passed the 60-second vertical burn test and offers nylon 11-like properties. This was a big step to this day. It is still a struggle to generate qualification procedures for 3D printed materials, parts, and processes. Capitalizing on the momentum from 2006, Stratus opened a new global headquarters facility in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, close to Minneapolis. At Euromold 2007, Object Geometries debuted its multi-material Connex 500 3D printing system. The machine is capable of printing two build materials simultaneously. Before the close of 2007, December was a month of full of introductions. Stratus announced the availability of its large frame FDM 900MC, which includes 32 parts that were manufactured with FDM technology. 3D Systems announced a new nanocomposite stereolithography resin called Acura Greystone. EOS introduced an impact-resistant LS material called Prime Part DC and a high elongation flexible material called Prime Part ST. In the quarter two of 2008, the world witnessed a new business model from the Netherlands-based Shapeways when they rolled out their service to the world. The company gives consumers a relatively easy way to convert 3D designs into parts or products. Shapeways offers a range of creator tools that simplifies the process of designing custom products for consumers. It has been a few years since any new 3D printing process was invented, but that ended in 2008 when Huntsman Advanced Materials of Switzerland announced the development of an entirely new additive manufacturing process based on micro light switch technology, abbreviated MLS. It uses 40,000 micro shutters and a raster approach to direct UV light onto the surface of a photopolymer. As the turn of the year, the quote big boys of the standardizing world met. 70 individuals from around the world met at the ASTM International Headquarters 
near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to establish ASTM Subcommittee F-42 on Additive Manufacturing Technologies. The committee was created to produce standards on testing, processes, materials, design, and terminology. Later that year, Realizer of Germany introduced the SLM-50, the first selective laser melting machine that fits on a bench top. The machine measures 800 by 700 by 500 cubic millimeters and processes stainless steel, tool steel, cobalt chrome, and gold. April 2009, Bits from Bytes of England released Ratman 3D Printer Kit based on the RepRap open source system launched at Bath University in England. This move would shake the industry for years to come. In August of 2009, 3D Systems acquired the assets of Desktop Factory from Idea Lab. Desktop Factory created an industry buzz when it announced a $5,000 machine in May of 2006. This relates back to Rapman 3D Printer Kit as the industry started trying to tap into the consumer hobbyist market as things like Shapeways started to grow. Before the end of 2009, ASTM International Subcommittee F42 on Additive Manufacturing Technologies published standard terminology for the industry, the first standard published by the group. Also, 3D Systems purchased AccuCast Technologies in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, and made a bold and brash move by launching its own 3D Pro Parts Service Bureau in October of 2009. As the first of several service provider acquisitions, 3D Systems marked the entrance into the paid parts business, effectively competing against its own customers. In July 2010, we saw additional advancements towards the industrial adoption of additive manufacturing as the ASTM F42 committee released its survey on additive manufacturing design rules. This work is seen as critical to continued adoption of additive manufacturing for end-use production parts. At the same time, the push toward the consumer market grew stronger as Delta Microfactory Corporation of Beijing, China introduced its extrusion-based portable personal 3D printer, UP. The machine was offered for less than $3,000. Z-Corp followed suit and released two low-cost 3D printers, the monochrome Z printer 150 at just under $15,000 and the Color Z Printer 250 at just under $25,000. This continued the industry trend toward lower cost 3D printers. September 2010 saw another business model innovation by the use of 3D scanning and printing as Inuis, located in South Korea, started a service named Invis's Hands to create true CAD data from 3D scanned point clouds. A locally installed application uploads the scan data to Inuis where company staff creates the CAD model. The finished CAD model can be viewed using the local application, and if the user is satisfied, the model can be purchased and downloaded. A quarter of a century into this technology, several industries were adopting additive manufacturing as their main method of manufacture, specifically in biomedical. Manufacturers of the in-the-ear hearing aids were first to adopt additive manufacturing technology industry-wide for the production of custom-fit shells. The dental industry began experiencing the same pervasive growth in the use of additive manufacturing systems. Also, direct metals processing technologies garnered significant interest in growth. It is believed that the possibility of novel designs combined with mechanical properties equivalent to wrought alloys with which designers are familiar may speed the adoption of metal-based additive manufacturing at a much faster rate than the polymer-based. When a key FDM patent expired, inexpensive equipment in the form of kits and fully assembled machines based on the RepRap open source project became available. Since their introduction, these low-cost personal systems have experienced very strong growth am among what has been coined makers, which are aka hobbyists and do-it-yourselfers. One can expect individuals and organizations to take advantage of similar opportunities when critical stereolithography and laser sintering technology patents expire. In August of 2011, Kimbium Global, New Britain, Connecticut, announced that it was shipping custom-made peak skull implants. 
Stereolithography models of a skull made from CT or MRI medical scan data are provided to the surgeon to allow for pre-surgery planning while the peak implants are being machined. It is estimated that this, this will reduce the operating room time by up to 85%. October 2011, ASTM International and the International Organization for Standardization announced a cooperative agreement between ASTM International Committee F42 and International Organization for Standardization Technical Committee 261 on Additive Manufacturing. The agreement will reduce duplication of their effort. EOS announced that it had surpassed 1,000 installed laser sentry machines in November of 2011. As 2011 closed, the industry as a whole really began to pick up steam. In 2012, the Department of Defense accelerated this when they placed a $1 million order with Stratus for its U-Print 3D printers to support the Department of Defense Starbase program. It aims to expose at-risk youth to science, technology, engineering, and math, and the role of additive manufacturing plays in advanced manufacturing technology. In April 2012, Stratus and Object announced their intention to merge. The combined company will be called Stratus and will have dual headquarters in Minnesota and Israel. The all-stock transaction was expected to result in a company valued at just over a billion and a half dollars. This was huge. A similar comparison on a large scale would be if Verizon and another medium cell phone service provider teamed up. The Additive Manufacturing Users Group, formerly 3DS Users Group, held its conference in Costa Mesa, California. With the opening of the group to users of all additive manufacturing, attendance more than doubled over 2011. And this continues to see a growth year to year. October 2012, the U.S. government announced the winning team for the National Manufacturing Innovation Institute. The public-private partnership was funded with $30 million of federal funding and an additional $39 million provided as a cost share, mostly from industry in the states of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Shapeways detailed every nerd's dream coined the factory of the future planned for its New York, New York manufacturing facility. The factory is expected to house up to 50 additive manufacturing machines and will be available to print 5 million products a year. As Shapeways makes its push for full-scale additive manufacturing processes, Voxeljet in Germany continues to try and overcome some of the challenges still holding the technology back, like build volume. It showed its novel continuous print VXC800 machine. Rather than printing onto a horizontal surface, the, v, the machine prints on an angled plane that translates on a horizontal conveyor until it exits the machine. This could conceivably allow for unlimited part length and continuous operation. As Voxeljet continued to blast the doors of build volume, in February of 2014, Oxford Performance Materials received an FDA 510K approval for its osteofab patient-specific cranial implants as the additive manufacturing started to become approved by the FDA. Just like when a key FDM patent expired in 2010, in May of 2013, the expiration of critical fused deposition modeling patents led to the explosion of material extrusion-based machines with low prices. Keeping up with a growing number of suppliers of desktop extrusion price printers available today is nearly impossible, and new manufacturers and machines continue to appear frequently on sites such as Kickstarter, Indigo, and eBay. Industry Standards defines any desktop 3D printer as a printer that costs less than $5,000. As the hobbyist market experienced unprecedented growth, so too did the suppliers of metal-based laser and electron beam melting equipment, resulting in extended delivery backlogs. A portion of this demand was driven by GE's aviation announcement that it would be 3D printing the fuel nozzles for its leading edge aviation propulsion engine. In June of 2013, Stratus announced that it would acquire MakerBot Industries for $403 million, again showing the push towards a newer, less commercial market. 3D printing is being used from the small garage hobbyists to large space agencies like NASA. NASA is primarily interested in this technology from a construction standpoint. 
It's expensive enough to get humans there, let alone all the typical construction equipment found on Earth. Made in Space and NASA teamed up together to develop a 3D printer that will be transported to the International Space Station in 2014 for zero-gravity part production. Logically, it makes sense. You are in space, i.e. a remote location. So it's not like you have an abundancy of replacement supplies if something fails. Nonetheless, this idea is still absolutely insane. From printing in space to printing your food, in January of 2014, 3D Systems announced a partnership with the Hershey Company to develop 3D printed edible products. The following month, Oak Ridge National Laboratories teamed with machine tool manufacturer Cincinnati to develop a polymer additive manufacturing material extrusion system that is expected to be 200 to 500 times faster than currently added to manufacturing machines. That just brings us up to date with the added manufacturing world. As you know, things are constantly changing and constantly evolving, and this list and this show could go on for much longer. I appreciate you bearing with me, and I hope you just got a glimpse of how fast and how crazy this new technology is and how much it's changed in just 30 years. As always, the show notes can be viewed at structural-md.com backslash P002. And if you have any questions or like me to come speak to your organization about specifically 3D printing, 3D printing technologies, how it can help you, what it can do for you, I'm more than happy to do so. You can leave me an email or a comment and I will be sure to respond as soon as I can. Until episode 003. Keep on learning. The Structural MD Podcast is sponsored by Additive Engineering Solutions, the world's first contract manufacturer to offer large-scale 3D printing services utilizing Cincinnati's BAM, Big Area Additive Manufacturing FDM technology. Their core services include design for additive manufacturing, new material development, printing parts and tools, finishing, machining, and coatings. If you have any questions regarding Additive Engineering Solutions and how they can help you, you can find their contact information in the show notes for this show.